Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 618. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I'm Sean Leland, Dr. Norge, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim, the sensei of the whatnot, the duke of you know, the sultan of strategy, the indestructible bridge defying, is worried whenever Sean hands him a beverage with mysterious ice and refers to him as stovetop whatnot, and the elder statesman of the podcast, Segulin. How's it going, eh? Jim, on this episode, we're going to be talking about the Batman Audio Adventures 80-page giant that is a prequel to the 10-episode HBO Max series. So I'm really excited to talk about that. We are sponsored, as always, by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Jim, what's going on over at DCBService.com? One of my favorite parts, 50% off. We have Batman the Detective hardcover, 50% off, only $12.49. We also have Batman the Imposter hardcover, 50% off, only $14.99. Thank you, DCBS. Over at InStockTrades.com, they always have deals of the week, and I'm just amazed by these. There's the Batman Fortnite Zero Point Hardcover. This is a $24.99 hardcover book. It's 65% off, only $8.74. Crisis on Multiple Earths, book one, crossing over trade paperback. For anybody that wants to see the origin of these crossovers, $39.99 regularly, 55% off, only $17.99. They have the DC poster portfolio of J. Lee, trade paperback. His artwork's amazing. $24.99 regularly, 60%, 65% off, only $8.74. Green, last one, Green Arrow, 80 Years of the Emerald Archer, the deluxe edition hardcover. This is a $29.99 hardcover, 60% off, only $11.99. This is, we're all on a budget right now, and if you're looking for a way to save money on some trade paperbacks or hardcovers that you may have missed, this is the way to do it. I mean, if you start bundling a lot of those together, you get like three books for the price of one. It's a great deal. So I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. Mr. Segula, what kind of a podcast are we? Rage and Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the book we're discussing on today's show. So, if you haven't read the book, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. Let's talk some comics. Nothing like the handy-dandy electro claw for carving through metal doors. Our first discussion is going to be on Batman the Audio Adventure Special. This is one of those 80-page giants. Jack Ryder in a Gotham City One Special Report. Dennis McNicholas is the writer. Leonardo Romero on layouts. Rich Ellis finishes. Mike Spicer colors. And World Design on letters. Batman in a Better Mousetrap is Dennis McNicholas writer. Anthony Marquez, penciler. J. Bone Inker, Dave Stewart colors. Ferran Delgado on letters. King Shimitar in King Shimitar, Who He Is and how he is come to being now. Dennis McNicholas is the writer. German Peralta is the artist. Christian Rossi on colors and world design on letters. Catwoman and She Called Pest Control. Dennis McNicholas is the writer. Emma Kubert on pencils. Roberto P on PGGI is the inker. Hi-Fi on colors. Carlos Manguel on letters. Penguin and Stove Plate, Stove Plate Sullivan in Bedtime for Scrambles. Bobby Moynihan and Dennis McNicholas are the writers. John McKell, artist. Nick Filardi on colors. Joshua Reed on letters. Riddler and Miss Tuesday in What Burns When It's Green. Heidi Gardner and Dennis McNicholas are the writers. Jacob Edgar, artist. Mike Spicer on colors. Carlos Manguel on letters. Robin in First One's Free. Paul Shear and Dennis McNicholas are the writers. Junie Ba is the artist. Nick Filardi on colors, Carlos Manguel on letters. Two-Face in two split seconds on Division Street. Ike Barinholtz and Dennis McNicholas are the writers. Derek Donovan on art. Rex Locus on colors. Pet Brousseau on letters. A surprise guest in Love as Laughter. Dennis McNicholas is the writer. Jesus Hervas on art. David Barron on colors. Ferran Delgado on letters. The cover is by Dave Johnson, variant cover by Francis Manipal, and the ratio variant cover by Tom Haskard. And apologies for any name butchery. 
I have been a big fan of the Batman Audio Adventures, the the podcast that they released on HBO Max, and the first couple episodes were released as an, an a regular just public podcast that was available. And when they announced this special, I wanted to I knew it was going to be a prequel special of sorts. I wanted to talk about this in particular because I know you and I digest medium differently, you know, as far as approaches to gaming, podcasts, things like that. So I thought it would be fun to talk about this because you don't need to have listened to the podcast yet to have appreciated this. I walked into this having listened to the entire podcast and then approached this. Have you listened to the podcast or is this your first exposure to this? What What's your background on this one? This is full uh, first exposure on it. You know, I have not listened to the podcast. It was funny. I didn't even want to go to the podcast yet mm-hmm. because I still wanted it to you know, just be just the book is my only exposure. But I'll be honest with you, this has me wanting to listen to the podcast. You know, so this this kind of did its uh, thing where it got me interested in because I want to hear the voices that are associated with this. I wanted to hear how they handle the action, how they do all that. kind of So it had me intrigued seeing, you know, a very physical book. You know, so I'm like, I want to hear how they handle this in the audio. And it's just part of me is just thinking we're going to have a lot of voices that sound like this, you know. And I just I, I want to hear what who the different people are. How are they doing their voices? How are they doing the different stuff? It, it's kind of it has gotten me interested in it. And it, it, this is to be honest, this has been an interesting journey for me in this book. In that when I first read it, I was like, okay, yeah, that's kind of neat, you know. But it's the through the multiple read throughs that really got me into some of these stories. And really got me going, you know, I want, I wonder, it, it had me thinking, is this an, a solo thing in the audience? Is this the solo on the podcast? Is this, you know, w- you know, which one of these stories continues in the podcast? Which one doesn't? How does this work? You know, it, it's, it has gotten me curious on the whole process. So, you know, it, definitely an enjoyable read, definitely kind of neat. And I think it was an interesting process for me because, again, I went in this completely blind. So it's seeing this universe and figuring out this universe. So they did a really good job on crafting it, you know, within the within this uh, special. Did you want more of this after you read it? Yes, hundred percent. Then you got ten episodes of this. The this I don't know. I mean, I am. This is so brilliantly crafted. This eighty page is what the ten episodes are. I mean, I'm not saying this is this is a prequel to it. So it's all new content. You basically can jump off of this jump right into that podcast production and you're getting this it's actually cool. formatted like almost identically to how the episodes are so i i did not know that walking into this and i was like feel i felt right at home i'm like oh my gosh this is so great it's more of see for me it was more of what i was enjoying about listening to this 10 episode audio thing that they put out there that was so well produced that I'm like, wow, it was this great surprise that was released on Batman Day where you're just like sitting there like, what is this thing? And because it was released on HBO Max, you know, to have an audio, exclusively an audio format production released on HBO Max, I'm like, well, this is cool. I hope people listened to it. And I mean, like really gave it like, and if they have, didn't listen to it initially, that they're jumping to it now. And that's part of why I really wanted to do this. I think there's a lot of reasons to jump towards something. And I think people might initially pass up something that isn't visual along with the audio. Wow, you're missing something off of this because the, the, the audio adventures themselves are really, really well produced. And I think this does really such a great job of highlighting what was so awesome about all of that. Because uh, they really play with a lot of the Gotham tropes and they have fun with it. Like this... While there is this, it's it's a great. There's some great Batman stories and some great character development with each of these characters. It's also not afraid to have some fun, especially with Jack Ryder. Jack Ryder being like this host of the whole thing could not be more perfect because it that goes back to classic comics, right? The classic comics where you had like this narrator figure that was sort of part of the story but sort of not. And Jack Ryder is kind of that person in this. It's got so much of a modern feel while having classic elements. And you're even your voice uh, when you were sitting there going, and I think that people are going to be sounding like this. 
you're right. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> nice. I mean, so I'm glad that I was smiling when that came across for you because you haven't been exposed to it. So you actually picked up from this the exact tone of what you're going to get from the audio adventures. It's a really cool production. So oh, that's cool. That, that's good. You know, and again, it's it, one of the things I was wondering is, do they go from story to story to story like how the book was? Because that, for me, was kind of a neat little thing where, again, as you said, with Jack being the host and kind of a little segue between the different stories, it's... I don't know. I thought that was that was a kind of a cool groove to it. So if that's the regular on the episodes, I definitely and I'm going to start listening to some of them. The Jack Ryder show is kind of the framing of the whole thing and very similar to how it jumps to like it goes from to one type of story and then Jack Ryder introducing little tidbits. There's even commercials in the audio adventures. Oh, neat. That are you know, that would be like kind of fit in. Yeah, similar to how this is formatted, the 80 page where you get like this meaty story and each story has like a different theme and tone. It's done that way, but it is done from a framing of Jack Ryder's Jack Ryder's show being the, the key framing piece off of this. And it comes off as classic radio because of the fact that it's an audio medium. You get the neat part is seeing now some visuals from this in this 80 page giant, which. I've got to give the creative team kudos on this. This was a very beautiful book and a well-produced... You know, I mean, the, the writing in this is really strong. This was an 80-page giant that cooked. Like, I, I didn't know what your experience was with as far as reading this one, but I thought the flow... This is an 80-page book, and I, I could not put it down. I sat, I sat down in one reading and, and plowed through this because it was paced so well. And I think DC's really nailed how to put together some unique 80-page giants where there's not, like, it's not cookie cutter. This does not feel, it, it, it has the elements of what's worked, I think, in some of the better 80-page giants and its pacing. But I feel like it's a very unique experience to other ones that I've had before, which, to me, for if you're going to give me an 80-page book, give me something that's going to make that going through those 80 pages a draw, you know, like keep it, keep it moving. So that way I'm not like, ah, I'm only going to read three stories because this has become kind of a trudge kind of thing. If I'm making any sense, this didn't have that feel at all. It moved. And I mean, the pacing was great. And I, I just wanted to, I'm like, Oh, I want to jump to another story or this is kind of fun. <laughs> and I do attribute a lot of that to the Jack Ryder pieces being this kind of teaser to get you excited for what's coming next. It was a nice framing convention for this that I don't think I don't want that necessarily in every book, but I loved it in this. I mean, it was yeah. really perfect. Well, the connection between each of the individual stories was kind of uh, a neat thing for me, you know, because it felt like this was one giant overarching story, whereas it, technically it wasn't really, but it had that groove to it. And I think because of Jack connection between each of them, and it's like, you know, introducing to Gotham City, you know, and it's, you know, kind of had that, you know, you know, groove to it. And I think that is one of the interesting things on this, because, you know, again, when I had my first read through, I was like, oh, OK, that's a good book. You know, and I, I wasn't like, oh, my God, this is the greatest thing in the world. And it wasn't when I went back in the second and third read throughs that you really do see the connection. and You do see what they're doing in the story. And I'm like, OK, this I can. You know, and that's what I started wondering. Is this how the radio show is? And that's where it got me thinking, you know, do they do this for the show and this and that? And, you know, our word for our sponsors, you know, that kind of stuff. And I was like, man, it, all this stuff I started playing in my head. As I was doing my second and third read throughs and I started hearing, you know, different stuff. And it was like, you know, the voices inside my head started really just tweaking what I was reading. So it was kind of a neat experience, you know, but again, this was second and third read through is dramatically different than first read through. First read through, I thought it was a good story. There's some neat stuff in there, some stuff that made me chuckle, some stuff. Oh, that's kind of cool. But it wasn't like, oh, my God, I got to listen to the audio uh, show. But again, multiple read-throughs, multiple understanding of what they're doing is what opened up, the, you know, opened up the world to me. So I'm definitely, you know, this is one of those things where I, I'm gonna, I now have to listen to these audio casts. So, a big tip if you're trying to listen to the audio casts on HBO Max, um, and it's this is gonna seem some of you're gonna be like, well, yeah, of course you could do this, but for me, I like to listen on my phone to audio, you know, just because it's portable, I can move around the house, I can do yard work, things like that. Um, don't forget the HBO Max app you can put on your phone. 
And I say that because I don't watch TV apps on my phone a lot. And some of you listening to this might be like, well, I listen, I watch a lot of my TV apps on the phone when I'm on the go and things like that. So you may be one of those people in, in respect. But um, I have an iPad that like if I'm going to watch one of my TV apps, I've got them all on my iPad, and that's typically my preference. So HBO Max was not something I had loaded on my phone. But I did load it on my phone for this, to be able to listen to the audio adventures because of the fact that, because it's not a visual medium, I like to be on the go and doing other things. And it, that was how I listened to the 10 episodes. Just a reminder that you can do that if you'd like to be portable. And I know <laughs> it seems kind of logical for it, but it wasn't for me initially because I was listening to the, I was listening to the first episode on my TV. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm like, I don't want to listen to 10 episodes this way. Um, so for me, my preference was to listen to it on my phone and on the go. Yeah. It worked really well. Yeah, I've got I'm, I've got HBO Max on uh, Isola. Yeah, I'm either going to do that or I'll sit up on my computer and listen to it that way. Because to be honest, it's, you know, for me, um, I, I don't my phone is my phone. It, it's a text machine. I use it to call people. I don't I'm not as, you know, you know I've got a smartphone. But, it, it, you know, it's not that smart. So I don't mess with it or it probably is smarter than I am. I just don't know how to use it. So, but, yeah. So for me, this is going to be iZilla or the computer, actually. So let's start talking a little bit about the story. We get this opening with the greetings from Gotham City. I really loved the art style in this one because there is... There's a fun factor to this, which I know that seems like a strange thing to say, but when it comes to Gotham... It, it's always great when people play around with having a little fun with some of Gotham's tropes, right? This is dangerous. Yeah. I mean, he's doing this, like, opening story that has this, like, fun kind of, like, framing as it's coming through. He's talking about, you know, Gotham's the city of glamour, of elegance, of thrilling nightlife. Or is it a city of senseless decay and senseless depravity? As this vehicle that is mouse-themed is driving up behind him with some criminals that are wearing mouse outfits or <laughs> looks yes. talking up behind him. What a great opening. And what is nice about this, it sets the tone of J who Jack Ryder is in this world, right? That Jack seems like he's this, you know, honest news guy who's trying to get the story when it, it he he's, he's a personality who's trying to get the story and also an opportunist, which you begin to start seeing in his excitement on the fact that they're capturing this. There's gunplay going on here. And you get to learn a little bit about Jack and the fact that he lives in the world of Gotham where if you are somebody like Jack Ryder, you can certainly get some renown being in a place like this. <laughs> I love the introduction to Jack because it's a one-page introduction to him, but it really sets the tone for who he is in this world, which is pretty critical. Yes. Oh, big time. And again, it's there's a lot of just the... the there's a lot of decent, honest uh, news people out there, but there are a lot of smarmy who are just exploiting, you know, horrific situations to get on television. You know, the, the media has multiple wide variety of people. So soda, and it was kind of neat how he's talking about how Gotham has this wide variety of people, but in reality, so do the media. Right. So do his, his people, you know, have this level of elegance, thrilling or senseless depravity, you know, that right there described the media in a simple sentence. And I'm like, oh, that was kind of that, that was something I was like kind of neat. And I like, again, seeing just, you know, this opening sequence with the uh, blind mice gang, which I'd never heard of before. But I now want more of the blind mice gang just because it's kind of it, it has that goofy wackiness to it that you know makes you go okay yeah you know and later on they're going to talk more about how you got to have some type of gimmick how you have to have something you can't just be a criminal in gotham and i'm like that for me was a really cool opening considering the stories that are coming down the pipeline so i thought that again really cool choice and i liked the inner dialogue you know of batman you know throughout this because yeah. again it's in my head, I'm thinking, okay, this is this is the kind of stuff that we're going to hear on the show, on the audio show. So we've got it here, and I'm like, you know, it, it was one of those things. I was like, man, this is, you know, it, it got me, you know, right from jump, going, okay, what is going on here? Who is this Batman? What is he talking about? What's the deal? I loved that the vehicle 
was like a like this unique version of the Batmobile because the Batmobile has undergone like a, a evolution over various decades over various art artists and I like that this one they pulled one that kind of is like this amalgamation of some of the coolest things of some of the cooler Batmobiles over time like they he just had a lot of fun with like this idea of this crazy Batmobile that incorporates some of the stuff that worked in the 70s, some of the stuff that worked in the 60s, some of the stuff that worked beforehand, some of the modern day stuff to it. I don't know why it's got that crazy like fire exhaust on the side of it, but it looked cool. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah. okay, we'll go with it. Because it's the Batmobile. And it's got to be one of those vehicles where you're like, that's cool. I don't know why they did some of the things that they did, but it's got the fire shooting out of the sides instead of out of the back, like you know when I grew up. It's, it, again, just having fun. I love the look of Batman in this because it reminds me a lot of what I've I've liked about some of my favorite artists that have captured this kind of classic timeless era of Batman. It just has that kind of edge to it. Like, this could easily be an animated series. Uh, I say that with the utmost compliment because, the you know, I think Batman the Animated Series, the most... Um, you know, the, the iconic iteration. I mean, obviously, I've enjoyed Batman animated throughout the years, but there's the, there's that iconic one. It has that kind of feel to it that I love so much from that. Darwin Cook's, a lot of Darwin's Cook's work, I think, um, is reminiscent here. And, and I say that not saying that this artist was deliberately trying to um, duplicate that. It's more thematically the style that I really appreciate, and I loved that uh, the art team chose to go this route with it because I think this story needed this kind of art style especially when you're getting into missiles flying out of the Batmobile his determination too I thought you know the facial expression was something that was really important to match the inner dialogue that you were referencing before that I think was such a great part of this story um, I really really love this yeah it, again I like the fact that this is you know this this Batman's going to be an actual agent of the police yep. he's actually going to be part of you know a deputized uh, kind of like going back to what the the, the 66 uh, batman has him as you know and i thought that again those are the kind of neat stuff that you know i, I enjoyed about this because he's talking about how he's no longer waging the war alone on his terms he's now an official ally with them when they're talking he's talking about mounting the bat signal and this and that and it's you know, for me, that was like, okay, this is kind of cool. This this Batman isn't, you know, yeah, he's still the Dark Knight, but he's not hiding in the shadow. He's going to be working with them. It's not just going to be something on the slide. And I always thought those were the, you know, those could be really cool stories if the if the actual superheroes became deputized agents and had full arrest authority and stuff like that, and actually were not just vigilantes breaking the law, but it was something else. Because you know, there's always been in the back of my head how easy it would be for someone who is busted by a vigilante to get out of it, out of the you know, given our current uh, criminal system. You know, because you know, any evidence that Batman turns over is inadmissible because he's not a cop. He's not. He's not anything. He's just some guy who beat him up, and the defense attorney can say he planted it. And there's no, there always will be easy to introduce doubt, you know, in the circumstance. So it, it was kind of like, you know, I like seeing this sort of, uh, you know, this official present, official declaration. Except that's not the whole story. And that's one of the things that I love because Batman's also not 100% sure about it for some obvious reasons. Because I love this line, for all practical purposes, I will cease to be a rumor of a specter in the dark and I will become something legitimate. It's an outcome I never foresaw when I began, and it's a mistake. And the mistake with him is his way of operating. You know, there's countless reasons not to do it. That's what I've been telling myself, beginning with the fact that the Gotham Police Force is corrupt on a scale that would be unimaginable anywhere else on Earth. So he's talking about there's some reasons that there's some concerns with this, and I like that it's not so cut and dry because it's Gotham's world. That's not downplaying anything you just said. I love that that's not the whole story and that there's some depth to this decision. It's not like Batman's deputized and we're not going to talk about all the other things that are associated with it. I love that this went into it. It's like, yes, he's going to be deputized, but there's pros and cons to that. Just like there were pros and cons to not being deputized, right? So yep. the, I love that that was such a rich part of this because I think if you're going to go there 
I, I don't know, remember there being this level of exploration about this before where they've really explored this idea. Because you're right, I grew up as a kid with the 66 show where he was this deputized, like, crime fighter and was working on behalf of the police. So I never got to see the story where it's like, well, what does that mean? I mean, you know, how did he feel about that? Was that something that he was always like gung-ho about or not? I love that this is going there, which I think is really unique. I don't remember ever reading. I mean, there might be stories like this where they were talking about it. I certainly don't remember them, though. I love that about this. Oh, yeah. And, and I'll tell you, it's, you know, I completely agree with you. I like how there is the the question in his mind and he's breaking it down because that's something Batman would do. But I love the, the way they told the story. Because you've got this you know, inner dialogue going on while Batman's hunting down the blind mouse game. And I thought that, for me, was a really neat way of doing it. You know, showing instead of, you know, you know, again, we've got the physical action we're watching. We're seeing, you know, the mouse game escape, crash the car, all that, you know, everything they're doing. But while that's going on, there's this inner dialogue, this inner discussion about what is necessary. And even talking about when he's talking about the... Uh, the, the secret city of Gotham, you know, the underworld that he calls the crime sphere. It's a, an ecosystem unique on the planet. I, I love just that logic and that understanding of the criminal element in Gotham City. We've, we've always said the best story, best Batman stories are where Gotham is a character. This is 100 percent showing you know, how the different levels of, you know, crime of, you know, it's, you know, the high thugs, the, you know, the uh, businessmen, you know, and just the, even the corrupt cops where he's talking about. I, I love that notion that he, you got to look at Gotham. It's not just a straightforward criminal element. There's so many different, um, you know, unique qualities of this city. And, I, and that for me was, again, one of those wonderful things that they put in this opening dialogue. I love when the the mice are like fighting Batman on that rooftop. When the when there's that line with some call it a secret city, some call it the underworld. It almost looks like a mousetrap game <laughs> in the way that like Batman's climbing up and they're up there on the rooftop. I love the intricacies of it. The artwork in this gets like pretty intricate. And it was something that I thought was really clever. You get this idea of Gotham. Gotham, we've talked about it before, is always this like really cool character. And I thought this story did a great job of continuing. Because while that's going on, it's not just the gang that's there. There is somebody spray-painting Joker graffiti. There is a, a heist going on in the other window. There is, um, a, a, I, I, I don't know if that's a repair of a vehicle or somebody's ripping off the tires from a vehicle. But I'm going to say that's probably mm -hmm. uh, someone taking some tires. <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm thinking so, too. But then you flash to a page where we get to see some of our... our you know, Gotham's rogues uh, going through. You see the Penguin, you see Two-Face, you see the police officers. It was cool to kind of see this interesting overview. And this really is, as you're referencing, through, as, a, as you're paging through it, really reminiscent. I'm a big fan of Darwin Cook's art, and I love how the more you flip through, especially when you start seeing the two police officers coming up on Batman, and we're seeing this team that's there... It does lend itself to exactly where you were going before, where you finally get this feel-good moment where one of the rookies is corrupt, the other is not, purely innocent, and you see Batman with a now, instead of what would have happened before, where that would have paid off negatively for Batman, Batman's not alone. There is an army of police officers waiting behind him because he's one of them. I loved that ending, and it was I was smiling as you were talking through why him being deputized was so, and, and just kind of guiding through your thought process because I do like this, and I don't necessarily want to see it in every Batman story, but I would not be against at all like a book that further explores this. It's not uncommon that we you know we get like the Curse of the White Knight series that's going on, you know where it's kind of its own world. I wouldn't mind seeing this continue, where we get to see a little bit more of the duly deputized Batman. Because I think I think it does offer its unique challenge to the fact that you are still going to have corrupt police officers because it's Gotham. But I think this is an interesting play, an interesting little twist on everything. And I really enjoy this. Um, that was something I thought that was a highlight of this, that they didn't feel like they had to play with... We have to stick to this continuity or that continuity. They pulled, I think, some really cool elements from all of Batman's eras and like made something unique in its presentation that feels very at home, 
feels very Gotham, feels very Batman, feels very connected to the characters that we know and love, but has some unique twists that make you go, hmm. I, I hope there's a sequel. Like there, this was a ten episode audio adventure, and then and this eighty page giant. I, whether we get it in comics or audio, or I, my preference would be, I'd love another season where we get both. Uh, this is the kind of stuff I really enjoy, and I feel this world that they've crafted, and a lot of the creative behind um, the voice work are involved in some of the writing of this, too. You know, when you start seeing some of those names like Bobby Moynihan and Heidi Gardner and Ike Barinholtz, they were on the audio adventures. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, it's so great to see the talent involved in the writing and the writer involved with this, this whole process. I, I just really... I really enjoyed this as a as a large experience, a multimedia experience. The only thing that would make this any better for me would be some form of animation that went along with it too. <laughs> you know, it's I'm greedy. I want more. I think that piece is cool, but I'm with you on really enjoying this exploration of the deputized Batman because I this was my guy. I grew up with the deputized Batman, so um, like a modern take on that. I'm like, okay, we can play with this. I'm into it. Yep. This is really cool. So we, we and I, oh, good. I agree with you on animated. This should be animated. I'll be honest with you. Mm-hmm. You know, I, you know, it's funny because even just looking at that one scene where he's talking about the cops, you know, and you know, with the crooked, you know, the you know possibility, you know, being set up by a crooked uh, cop, and this and that. McCormick is clean, but I can't say the same for her partner. And just the look, the smarmy look on his face, you're like, oh yeah, he's crooked. <laughs> I'm not saying, and I want to be clear on this, I'm not saying in place of the audio adventures as they were. I'm saying in addition to it. I would like a animated, not a representation of like a new story. I want a new story. I want to, it's set in this world. My reason for that is I'm loving this resurgence of audio being used as a delivery medium. I think it's really great. And I think audio productions... Um, we, we've gone from podcasts like ours where we're doing commentary to now just just full-blown cast productions of story more story and i love story so i think this is just a great opportunity to use audio more for that this was a good move so i'm glad that we got i mean batman has such a rich history in audio from radio back in the day i love the fact that you know today we're doing a modern modern 10 episode um and it's not uncommon nowadays for you know, in this Netflix, HBO, you know, binge watching Disney Plus era that you wouldn't get stuff like this. And I think it's really great that like now we've got a 10 episode audio. I hope that they're getting a lot of downloads from this. And and if you haven't listened to this, please give it a shot. I think you're missing out on something that's really unique just because I want to greedily. I know it's going to be the amount of people that actually check it out is going to drive if there's going to be more. So I would suggest at least check out the first episode and see if it's your cup of tea because I I really want more of this. And if you like it, tell other people about it uh, because that's the only way these things you it's the only way wind up getting more. A lot of times you see the negativity of people. I don't use an example. Um, Eternals came out recently. I loved Eternals, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about why I loved it. I walked it, but I will say I walked in completely blind. I knew Eternals from like guest appearances in comics, so I'm aware of the. I walked in being aware of the characters from seeing them in like Fantastic Four and and other in other books where they were guests, but never solo books. It just was something in my budget I never had. So I walked into that movie blind and felt like I walked out understanding at least the MCU concept of what the Eternals are and wanting more. What I saw was a lot of people jumping on, you know, the hate of Eternals. I I feel like it's really important that we as comic fans, when we like something, I'm not saying don't, you don't have to like sugarcoat something you don't like. If you don't like it, fine. Don't like it. That's cool. That's respect. Everyone has different tastes. That's cool. So, you know, you may be sitting there when I'm saying you love, I love the Eternals and going, I didn't. I've been a longtime fan and it wasn't my cup of tea. Cool. Respect. That's difference. But I feel like what we don't do well enough is when we really enjoy something, getting the word out to other people why they should support it, and then we're baffled why there's not more of it. And I think we as fans have an opportunity to be that leadership of saying, hey, 
this audio thing that they did was really cool. I want more. I'm going to start telling people about it and why they should listen to it. So I'm asking you, please, if you like this, point people to it. If you didn't, it's not your cup of tea. Cool. Respect. That's one of those things. I just I want to see more of that outreach. I think our crowd, and I, I really say that as a respect to our listening audience, I think if you're listening to this show, you're already that kind of person. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> I guess because I feel like we've got. I don't think you're listening to this show if you if you don't like that kind of thing because we've kind of got a way of operating here. I think that people <laughs> people. I, I think if you're listening to this, you're one of us. So it's uh, it's kind of the way I look at it. So I appreciate all of you for for supporting the things that you love. So okay, welcome back, folks. We've arrived in Gotham City, the largest city in the world. These segments where you get to see more of this, where we're seeing, you know, the famous pierogies. I felt like we were going on this really cool tour of Gotham City. And for me, I want to go to Gotham. I know you don't want to go to Gotham City. I do. There's something wrong with me. I admit that. I don't want to live in Gotham City. I want to visit Gotham City. And I'm going to be very clear on that piece. If I was going to live in a city, it'd be Metropolis. But I won't lie. There is no way, if Gotham City really existed and there and really was a Batman and all that, there's no way I wouldn't visit it. I would be very careful on making sure I'm only going out during the day, and I'm in a place that's very secure at night, and I probably wouldn't stay long. It'd be like a weekend thing, at best. Maybe go during the week when it's less action, I don't know. <laughs> I have a feeling Gotham on the weekend is tempting fate, um, but I would love to go there. Um, there's something... I. Th- I think maybe that's the Tim Burton films where the, he made like Gotham such a character in those films. Like I kind of want to walk through that. I guess in my mind, what would Gotham look like? It'd be like the Tim Burton films. Well, it's funny when we were kids and I don't know if you had the same dealings, but like with me, New York city had this, this persona to it yep. that it was like crime ridden and people were getting shot and killed and mugged every 10 seconds. And it, it had just this huge idea in my head of what, you know, and it was not positive about New York city. And I remember the first time we went there, my head was on a swivel the entire time because I was like, oh, yeah, I'm just waiting for something bad to happen. And then nothing bad happened. And, you know, and, and every time I've gone since I'm getting, I walk around a little bit more and I get to see the city and I, get to understand it and you kind of get a groove going my sister constantly goes to you know to new york and she loves it you know and it's one of those things i think for me right now gotham would have that same if gotham actually existed i would have that same mindset where i would i would have that notion where at any second joker could kill you or something crazy, some riddle would pop up. If you don't answer correctly, you die. You know, and that would be the notion I'd have in my head. Now, unfortunately, my, you know, well, fortunately, my New York, my opinion as a child of New York City was woefully inaccurate. My opinion on Gotham, that's accurate, dude. <laughs> that stuff actually happens. So, yeah, if Gotham City existed, I think the 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 little kid in me would win out. And there's no way you would ever catch me walking in this city. See, now, this is where we're the opposite. The little kid and me would win out and I'd go. (laughs) (laughs) The rational adult in me would be, like, we'd be ignored. Uh, It's funny. Your reference actually is a pretty good one, though, when you're talking about New York City, because, uh, you know, the same thing with, like, L.A. and big cities like that. I think we should, it's funny, we live in Cleveland. I mean, which Cleveland in itself has its share of issues. Um, I love Cleveland uh, for I mean, we've got an amazing theater district. We've got great museums. We've got really cool stadiums. I mean, there is a really cool culture in Cleveland. But like any big city, there's larger numbers. There's greater risk of crime and and, um, and violence and things like that that are there. And I think some of that just goes back to being smart when you go to big cities and, and how you react. And I think it, it's funny. I, I would encourage people to visit Cleveland because of everything I just said, because I I think Cleveland is a very cool city. The same way when I visit um, New York or I visit LA, there's so many cool things going on there, really cool places to visit. But big cities have that kind of, you, you have to be prepared for that sense of there's a greater risk of crime, you know, when you're there. And um, if you're smart and you play by the rules, 
um, you you're typically going to be just fine. You know, you don't you don't want to be like at three in the morning wandering down an alley. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> you know. I think actually, I think Batman kind of prepares you for how to behave when you go to a big city. <laughs> it's kind of like this is kind of a guidebook to like don't do dumb things. <laughs> yes. Don't walk down a street called Crime Alley. <laughs> right, right. It does, now it does does it make you a hundred percent safe? No, but I really do think like some of this is educational. <laughs> I love Jack Ryder in this though because you you see the the artwork on Jack. You see almost this per, this perverse pleasure that he gets off of talking through this city and kind of the craziness that is Gotham. And it's something that I really love as you flash into this King Shimitar story, which it's it's this guy who has, you know, been down and out in his luck and comes to, you know, he's he's, he's an old time thug who basically isn't getting noticed because he doesn't have a gimmick. You know, he's kind of recognizing the fact that, OK, you know, I, I'm not being taken seriously as a, even even like a little thief, like the beekeeper is stealing my stuff from me because I have no respect, even though I, he he presents himself as a pretty badass, tough guy. You know, when you take a look at him, I mean, he's I love the drawing of him because I think it's really important that he looks like a formidable thug before he's given his quote unquote gimmick. Right. So you sit there and you go, I get his frustration. This dude, he's legit. And yet he's not, because he's in Gotham and he doesn't have a theme, he's not being taken that way. Any other city, this guy would go in there and people would be impressed, right? Not Gotham. Yep. Not, they don't work. This, the, the suit and the, you know, the, the built impressive gangster look doesn't really work in Gotham. You're always going to be a number two or number three man if you're going by that gimmick. And yes. I, I loved that theme. Um, this was such a great story about what it's like to try and become a master criminal in Gotham. And I thought this was a, a really fun story that had some depth to it and made a lot of sense. Yep. Well, and it's the notion of you got to have a gimmick. You know? And I, I love that about this. Even like when he's robbing the bank. And the, the teller is like, ah, you know, not even, you know, he gives the money, you know, gives up the money. So the guy gets the money then, but he's like, hey, you know, oh, boy, oh, no, what are you, Mr. Accountant, Captain Accountant or, you know, normal man, you know. And, and for me, I was reading that, and, you know, whenever banks are involved in books or stories, I always look and I always look a little heavier. Now, in a branch, they would never do this kind of stuff. They would comply and that's the way you're trained. But I did I did find this funny, you know, how he still complies, he still gives the guy the money, but he does talk some smack to this guy. You know, and it's you know, you think you look at it, he's got the big thick plexiglass between him and the robber and this and that and it, it, he's not too worried about it. he's not worried about his safety because he's like, Ah, this is just some guy. It's not like this is the Joker or anything, you know. So it for me that was a weird, cool moment. Because normally stuff like this I would get a little annoyed with, but I actually enjoyed this and I actually was laughing along with him and I liked again I liked how they did a quick birth of how he became who he is, how he actually did pick up his gimmick, and how he realized, okay, the suit and the gun isn't scaring, but this big old sword, that scares people, okay? <laughs> and that's the piece where I agree. It, it, I love that out of out of what was just his natural outfit from where he came from, it, it put him in a place where there was a natural gimmick there. Maybe not the one that he originally planned, but there was a natural gimmick that was there that I thought was really, really cool. Uh, by the way, I love the artwork of this because I, I think when you see him, he's got to come off as intimidating throughout the entire time because you got to believe in him. I believed in him. And in some ways, I, he's, at the end, I'm like sitting there, I'm like, I'm feeling bad for this guy, and he's a crook. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what is wrong with me? But that, that tells you a story that's well-developed where the character, I, I don't want to say he's become a sympathetic character, but you start to know him three-dimensionally in this story. And that is something I thought was really well done because King Shimitar in this, after he got his gimmick, you know, where, where he was kind of winning. I mean, you see the vehicles, and like he's got the flashy vehicle now that has the Shimitars on the front and he has the women, he has the respect 
and and the tigers that he has there, which I thought was a, was a really cool piece of it. It was all you know leading him towards this point where he's trying to get the ultimate weapon to go after Batman again. And I loved how like there's this black market where based on who you are is how high up the food chain you are and to get this equipment, right? Like, he has to get into a line to get equipment to try and take down Batman because he's not the Joker, he's not the Riddler, he's not the Penguin, where I guarantee you the people running this market are knocking on their doors, whereas these type of people, they're not because they're not the big ticket, big spenders. Like, even though he's quote-unquote made it, he still hasn't made it to supervillain status yet. Now, walking out with that big knife, I think does put him in a different category. Well, it, it, he's just a Robin problem. And I yep. love that notion because that was even, you know, Batman came in, kicked his butt, and, he, and then even to add it to it, like, you're a D-lister, a buffoon, a renegade from a folk dancing troupe. You should know I was this close to just sending Robin after you tonight. You know, I'd love, just again, really cool, beautiful Batman smack talk right there. And then even that continues on when he's at the, uh, you know, when he's at the black market. Hey, we got a, a Robin problem looking for a bat killer. Like, oh man, that is awesome. But the, the, the big old blade he gets, there's something more to that blade. Oh, That's yeah. a cursed blade. That's a demon blade. There's something with it. You know, the red eyes on, you know, on the blade tells me there's something more here. <laughs> wait, there's kooky writing, too, on the blade. Like, you don't, you can't see what yes. it is, but you actually see that there... And, and wait, there's quite a bit of script there, which, to your point about there being a curse of some sort, yeah, there's something to that. And that's, I, I really loved that, like, that ended with that kind of cliffhanger, like, where's he going to go next? It was just really well-developed as a story. But the Roblin problem thing, I think you're right, because it wasn't just a, a term that Batman coined, because you, you almost start thinking to yourself afterwards, did Batman coin that or did villains coin that? And how did it get, like, become a thing? I love that, because that's the first time I've ever seen that before, somebody being called a Robin problem. And that's yeah. a great concept. <laughs> oh, big time. Big time, and, and again, it's I like how he, they, the Robin problems had that separate line, and you start looking at them like you're like, okay, I don't recognize anybody. I can see how maybe yeah, these would be some of the D listers and whatnot. So I was like, oh, that's cool. But again, it, it, it's I love how this book does continue on with this multiple tier leveled. Um, hierarchy system of the criminal element. It's, yep. it, it does take a deeper look at stuff, and that's kind of neat. Growing up, one of the things I've always loved, and I love that there was this Catwoman in this outfit, you know, with this kind of theme of, like, okay, when does this... I love that this year, kind of like, when does this actually take place? And it doesn't really identify that, nor does it need to. It's got that classic kind of feel to it. I love this this idea of the blind mice gang encountering Catwoman. And we get this whole little story about, uh, you know, Catwoman's score and her going after this gang. And the gang talking about how Catwoman's a little bit of a different element. About how she doesn't have, like, a crew. She's got, like, worshippers. And you kind of get why she would have a very different vibe about her. There's a, the Catwoman at her best is always this unique mystery, this unique enigma that has evolved over time. But even when like she and Bruce are together and she's on the side of the angels, she still operates differently than everybody else. And I like that about her, that she's malleable. You can make her a completely a good guy, and yet she's still going to be different. It's kind of like Harley, right? Harley, we've seen Harley as like the baddest of the bad, something in between. And then now we're seeing her on the side of the angels. But yet she's still Harley Quinn. Like there's, <laughs> you know, I mean, and I think Catwoman's got that. Catwoman's like the originator of that, right? She can, she can kind of go either way. And you can understand why and how circumstances gets there. But I love that in this score where she's she's looking to take the money to hurt them and, and honestly take take some of the um, the biggest elements that'll pay off her. You see Catwoman who is at this point in time in her career kind of selfish, but she looks at this girl and who's who's been it's Rupert Thorne's kid who has been kidnapped, and she's like, oh, I, I can't really take you. I'm going to leave you here. Don't worry. Your dad's going to your dad's going to come and get you. I mean, he's going to take care of this. You know, sorry, but then all of a sudden she sees the bad signal 
And you see how that relationship is like impacted her. This is clearly earlier in her career where she's like, oh man, now that I've seen that, I got to kind of do something for this kid. But again, <laughs> even that is uniquely Catwoman, right? Because <laughs> it's not it's not 100% the way Batman would do it. Yes, she's rescuing this girl. This kid's like all of a sudden like, oh, she's my hero, my protector. I love you, cat lady. And yet we all know just from this, like, She's not looking to hang out with this kid. At the end, she uses her for ransom. Like, <laughs> we know the kid's going to be treated as well as she possibly can be. Sort of. She's still in the trunk. <laughs> oh, hold on. She's not only still in the trunk. She's still bound and gagged in the trunk. Right. So not only did, you know, because there's a point in time when the girl's free and untied up and she's open and she's talking and this and that. So Selena then retied her up, regagged her, put her back in that trunk. I absolutely love this. This again, this was one of those cool things because it does show a little bit about, you know, it gives us a good glimpse on Selena. She still is a crook. She's hitting the blind mice game because they've been hitting museums and banks and they she knows they've got a really good score. I'm going to take it from them now. You know, and but in the middle of it, as you said, she runs into that that question of conscience. And even the when the bat symbol pops up, that's like, okay, I I can't leave her here. I got to save the little girl. But she's still Catwoman, and I I loved that ending with this because again, this had so many different levels. One, it does give us more of the blind mice gang, which again, I really dig this uh, this true. I I want to see more of the blind mice gang. I do too. You know, it, it kind of makes me. It, they're kind of funny, but they do have some criminal element to it. But also, I love Selena in this. This was an absolute, just you know, really cool exploration of who she is in this universe. This was this was a fun, awesome read. And again, the ending. Just I love the art styling on this because just that look on her face as she's talking to you know uh, Rupert saying, "You know, I got uh, bad news. I'm afraid the ransom is not out, damn." Uh, is double. We'll we'll call it a finder's fee. And just that look on her face as she's talking to the dad, and you see the kid in the background, big old bulging eyes. What the heck's going on, man? You know, I loved it. So then we flash to the Iceberg Casino with the next segment, and I love Jack Ryder as a tour guide, right? Because because <laughs> yeah. of the fact that he's a little smarmy and 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 shady in some of his stuff. I mean, yes, there is the the fact that he is like a personality, and you get why people would tune into his show. But you also tune into him because there's times where he's a bit of a jerk. <laughs> I mean, and, yeah. and you kind of like that too, right? So he's guiding you through the casino and introducing you to the talent. And that's clearly the Joker at the table, right? Where you see him, the back of him. I, I took it as being the Joker. Yeah. But I don't know. Then the mayor, you see the mayor. The mayor like realizes he's on camera and he's, he's like wondering, okay, what did I just say? Uh, if I said something I shouldn't have, I'll undergo sensitivity training, all that. <laughs> you know, because he's being caught in the Iceberg Casino. But then it flashes to, I think, this really cool story about Stoveplate Sullivan, who is this talented act who thinks he's got some form of power that reality sets in pretty quick for him in the world of the Penguin. I loved this story. I love the art style first. I love that he's wearing, like, this zoot suit <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. And you get why like people would be really drawn to him. But why of all the cities that you'd want some form of power in, why would you go for Gotham? Yeah. Especially if you're a guy like Stove Plate Sullivan. Like the the world's a big place. <laughs> why would you make this the choice? Well and this guy is actually famous. You know, this is one of those things where he's not just some desperate guy. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they show the movies on the wall and the the thing and this is a big name outside of Gotham. Right. But you come to Gotham, you play Gotham rules. And I thought that for me was a really neat concept because you're sitting there and you know, I, I remember just seeing the the fly in the ice cube, like, what the heck? You know, and just, you know, then you get, you know, you see him grooving and bobbing and weaving. And, dude, I'll tell you that this, I love, I love this type of penguin. This was a great penguin because, again, it's, it shows just that beyond the, the cheesy umbrella gimmick, there is yep. a master manipulator. There is just this vicious, vicious individual. You know, and, you know, he sometimes is underrated and downplayed by people because they just think of him as some weirdo guy. No, 
he is extremely dangerous. And I, I love how he put Stoke Plate in his place immediately. Yes. And it wasn't even beyond just putting it in his place. He completely broke the man in one meeting. And I love that. Especially with Mr. DeCondor. Because one of the things Penguin is really good at is recognizing his his limitations. And I think that's part of his strength, right? Because I think people always struggle with overcoming their limitations and finding... Penguin is pretty good at surrounding himself with people that take care of his weak spots. And I yeah. really enjoy that about the character and the writing in this story in particular. Well, the one thing you... The one thing about the Penguin, he's not a reluctant leader. <laughs> the funny part with the Penguin, you're talking about reluctant leaders, though. I think it's usually the people that are reluctant to be led by him. Because <laughs> there always is, I mean, how do you trust that guy? Like, even Mr. DeCondor, right? Okay, he's only with the Penguin for as long as he's useful. And if the Penguin is going to be, like, arrested or hurt or anything, you can be darn sure Mr. DeCondor is going to be expendable. Now, there's obviously a financial advantage right now because things are going good for the Penguin. So I'm sure Mr. DeCondor is very well compensated. And it's probably a really, really good gig for now. But there's a ticking clock on that gig because we've seen the Penguin's world change time and again. And his thugs. Like, I don't know. i never seen Mr. DeCondor before. And I'm not sure we're going to see Mr. DeCondor again after all this. So I think that's kind of the story of the Penguin, right? I think there's something to that, that like his his right-hand person changes all the time. The the gift of the cat, <laughs> when you open that up, a gift from a true oh. fan, I mean, oh, I wouldn't worry. You can get Dorothy another scrambles. I mean, basically, he's saying, I know your wife. I know your cat. Um, you know, he's, he's, you're not safe. I can get, I can, that your home is your safest place, right? This guy's already impacted his home. Uh, at the yeah. end of the day, any form of pretense that he had up there, st- you're right. He broke him. I mean, that, that's the only way. I mean, to that journey of him breaking him, I thought was just really, really, I thought like a cool piece that I love that was written, co-written by Bobby Moynihan, who is, I love Bobby Moynihan on Saturday Night Live and, um, his current voice work and acting work is, is really I think he's just I think he's really talented and funny. I thought him being involved in this story, I was glad to see so much of the talent involved in the writing of this. This Dennis McNicholas, who's uh, I think he I think Dennis wrote, if I remember correctly, he was involved in the writing of every story in this, um, and he had co-writers on on some of them. I really loved this writing style and this particular theme. I want to see more. Yes. Well, and one of the things I loved is the, the fact that Penguin broke him, it, you know, it, it was, well, well, the cat was a big one, you know, and the mentioning of the wife, but I love just that little, the, the subtlety of the slaps. Those weren't heavy handed hits and punches and Mr. DeCondor didn't smack him around and beat him up. Those are just smacks. You know, those are the smacks to put him in his place, to let him know you are nothing here. Wow, bam, hit him again. You know, you'll do nothing. Bam, hit him again. Throwing ice cubes at him. You know, again, these are high damage inflicting. This is the I can do what I want to you. And then when, you know, that leading up to the pack, then he opens up the present and he sees his frozen cat in there. And then just a reference to his girl. Like, you know, next time you open up the box, it could be her head. Next time you, you know, see a cube, it could be her in there. It could be, you know, and there's just that so many little things. I loved just, again, the subtleties of how nasty and vicious he is. This was a beautiful portrayal of, you know, of the penguin. And even this, that the final play, you know, when they show later on when he's, you know, when stove plate's getting ready to go on and he's got to splash some water in his face. You kind of see just the, the tears, the emotion, then light comes on and the smile comes on and he's got to perform because it's the penguin. I'm not angry, upsetting the penguin. But even then later you see he's drinking from the, the, the flies and the ice cubes, you know, and it's just, okay, I, I get, this is what I got to do now. This is who I am. You know, I love that part of the story too. Whatever variations there are of Wayne Manor in comics or even on film or whatever, I love, uh, this is, 
I love this one where it gives you this idea of this thing being ginormous, which sometimes in stories they they don't really portray this. Where as a kid growing up, I always felt like they're because of the fact there was a bad cave and they went underground and things like that, there was always this idea of the fact that this was so huge that you could have stacked cars and things like you see in the background yeah. of this one. This He's got a bowling alley. Um, I love the fact that Alfred takes him to the bowling alley that's in Wayne Manor. That, to me, is Wayne Manor money, what you think of, of Bruce being that rich. It's one of the reasons why... If you'd ask me in present day continuity what I'd eventually like to see, I do want Bruce to get the fortune back at some point. And yes, I want a way for them to bring Alfred back. Like, I'm waiting for the story, The Return of Alfred. There's got to be at some point in time The Return of Alfred. Um, I don't know when we're going to get that. Um, I'm hoping, I guess I'm hoping against hope we get that. Just because of the fact that these moments... It's something uniquely Batman that you get when you see this. I, that's not a knock on any of the current storytelling. I love everything I'm reading right now in Batman. Part of the fun, though, when you have those stories is you start to miss certain elements. And when they eventually give them back to you, they mean something more. Because you've got them back and you've got a chance to explore them with a fresh perspective. This story just kind of makes me yearn for when that eventually is going to happen, when we'll get a chance to explore this again with Bruce. Because <laughs> yeah. I do want to see and, that. And I love that it was Alfred who basically took the hit on this. Mm -hmm. You know, how, you know, you t I was told he'd be here all Friday evening. Hold on a moment. Is it, is it Friday? Oh, that explains it. Master Bruce friends every Friday evening at the penthouse in the city. Oh, silly me. I'm just the butler. What do I know? I, that I love that little bit because going through it was kind of neat. And I even liked how Alfred's playing on the, oh, I hope he hasn't gotten lost in the hedge maids again. You know, and just, you know, little stuff to give Bruce that cover of being the, the rich playboy, goofy, airheaded guy. No, it's, you know, it, you know, it adds to the how can people not think that Bruce Wayne is Batman. Moments like this. Stuff like this is what makes people think that Bruce Wayne is not Batman because they play it out so well. It's everybody is in on the joke. Everyone's in on the game. Everyone's in on the con. Now, anybody who has this, who knows the secret, knows to play it up for Bruce so people don't suspect him. I, I love moments like this where it actually, it further shows why it works. It's kind of like, you know, some of the stuff with uh, Clark. When we see the really good stuff with Clark where they show, you know, before the secret was out, how it wasn't just glasses. He used to slump over and he used to bumble. He used to be a clumsy oaf and he used to have physical act he had to do to make people not think hey that's he looks a lot like superman without if he took his glasses off no there's more to clark's physical portrayal to make people not think he's a superman same thing on bruce he's got to have this little side hustle going you know and again a little one page spread but it was something that was really cool this next story with miss tuesday it's it's co-written yeah. by heidi gardner from saturday Night live <laughs> and dennis mcnicholas and I reference Heidi Gardner because I th she's another one I think. I'm a big Saturday Night Live fan, and I think she's incredibly talented. So it's cool to see these two together because right? I think they've they as a writing team obviously did just such a great job with this story. I would love to see Miss Tuesday become the Waldo of the DC universe, where they just plop her <laughs> in different stories and have her do commentary on it, because her whole analysis of. Arkham Asylum and every person straight on through. I love how snarky she is about everything. Yes. You're back? Oh, I thought we were re rehabilitated to you. Oh, no. A blemish on the otherwise spotless record of Arkham Asylum? Just let me in. <laughs> I, just, I love, like, right from the get-go, that line tells you everything you need to know about Miss Tuesday and set the entire tone for this story, which I just thought was brilliant. This is somebody who, again, if I wanted to see an animated series... I would love a Miss Tuesday miniseries where, again, it's Miss Tuesday going to various different places and just plopping her in an event that otherwise... Like, you could take her and plop her in events that have already happened and just have her do commentary on it, and I would watch that in an instant because I love the snark. <laughs> it's just yeah. so good. Well, again, it's this is one of the... This story was actually probably... I, I would... If I had to, you know... Put you know, gun to head. You have to pick one story as your favorite. 
this is the story for me that was my favorite. Yeah. Because I absolutely love as you, everything you're saying. I'm nodding my head along with you. How Miss Tuesday is this fabulous character. And I love how in the beginning you got, you know, the teenage snark going on. And it's just that it right from jump, you know, OK, this kid's got a little bit of an attitude, but you kind of understand why. She sees the incompetence that everybody else sees about Arkham. And she's just strolling through while all the, while all the inmates are doing what they're doing and the guards are barely struggling to keep some semblance of control. And it's just, oh, boy, da 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 She's like, and even like the line, Eddie, why do you pull this stuff on Friday nights? I had plans, you know. It just She cracked me up right from the beginning. And I absolutely loved this. And then even... As the story gets on and gets a little deeper, you start understanding, you know, you know, this is even before we get the Riddler introduced into this. And we don't get to start seeing Riddler interaction. And just I want to see Miss Tuesday and the Riddler interaction again and again and again. This is a wonderful story. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you on this being such a wonderful story because the interactions between the two is really great. Her, her interactions with Arkham was great. It just, again, the irreverence. Her, her she has got this constant annoyance and irreverence with everybody in a way that sometimes we do as fans where you kind of look at them and go, you bonehead. You know, I mean, she's right out there in front basically calling them out on all of it. And I think that part was a really great part of the story. Such a cool component. <laughs> well, the line of Riddler is acting out in ways that are unacceptable. He should probably be in a mental hospital. <laughs> <laughs> I love that line. It snapped back to her. But then even, I tell you, it's that moment when when he throws it back to her saying, hey, you two have a unique relationship. Just that look on her face. She's like, yeah, I'm the only one who could probably help them. What has he done now? You know, and it was just that that the two little panel there where you could just see the inner turmoil going through her head, and she's like, "Okay, yeah, I've got to do this." <laughs> right from when she walks into the Eddie, they called me again. You know, you just knew where this was going to go. Her whole confrontation with Eddie, where he's like going through like his stories and his plans, and I, I love the I love the point in time where he's talking about how he could be Batman, like. He could do it better than they do. He could be the hero. And she's like, yeah, yeah, like, I would wear that. You know, he's he's got these <laughs> ideas of him being, like, you know, Batman but with a question mark and with her being the Robin figure. And she's like, that's not going to be me. I'm not going to do any of that. But I love that he's convinced. I, I think deep down we know what the real phobia is. He knows that Batman continually one-ups one him, and he's struggling with that fact. He wants to be better. He... I don't think it, at his core he believes he's better. I think he believes Batman's better. But he can't let himself accept that. So he's constantly got to struggle with the idea, I am so much better than Batman. I would do this better than Batman. I am... And he's driven by that. The, the tricking Batman, the outthinking Batman, the outsmarting Batman, the reason, the motivating drive of that is respect, right? He's looking for that level of respect. It is kind of a weird motif in Gotham because it goes back to the King Shimitar story, right? You can kind of see how that's an ongoing theme of these, some of these villains increasing their um, escalating because they're trying to get some level of respect. It does add an element to does Batman's presence alone escalate some of this? And you can make an argument. This story kind of says, yeah, it does. Because <laughs> it <laughs> motivates the Riddler, doesn't it? I mean, to, to just keep going further to try and one-up. And it's an interesting sort of conundrum where you sit there and go, how, how much does Batman help in those situations? And I say that as a huge Batman fan and loving these stories, but I love that that's, there's a kind of a reality to that, right? Yeah. Well, and it's, it's one of the interesting things with, because um, one of the reasons this story really did touch me was because it it did have me thinking off page. Mm -hmm. And it not only had me thinking back to some of those great Riddler stories where he was legitimate and he was a detective. His yep. own had his own private eye agency and this all those stories. I always thought that was kind of neat where the Riddler wasn't a bad guy. But you know, you know, you're just waiting for that moment when he would shift back to his old ways and it, it was that really cool, you know, just that will he, won't he kind of moment going on. And I loved just how even throughout this, as you said, Whitler really has to convince himself that he's better. 
than Batman. And all the evidence points against that. And throughout this, you know, you could see him going back and forth, back and forth, just how, you know, even even talking about how many times Batman's locked him up. He's only locked me up three times. It was four times. Only three times. Fake news. Fake news. The, the third, you know, was a total asterisk, you know. And I, I really did like how he's got to keep that, you know, mindset in his in his own brain about how he isn't as, you know, how Bruce isn't the greatest detective. He is. Bruce isn't couldn't be the best crime writer. He could be. That, for me, was a really cool moment because I remember when I was a kid, you know, I used to, you know, when we watch wrestling, I used to think, oh, I could do that. I could be a writer for the thing. I could come up with great plots and story twists and all that was great stuff. And, you know, I can't, you know, I, I enjoy watching it. But when it comes to actually laying out the what the match would happen, I know, you know, I, I know my strengths. I know my weaknesses. They've got creative people doing that. Same thing like when I watch movies or I read comic books, you know. You know, you have those moments, those flashes in your mind where you're like, hey, maybe I could do this. Maybe I could create some great story. No. You know, there's a skill level that you have to have to be able to fashion these stories, to do these multiple levels, to lay it out so you're leading your reader through the process, you know. You know, the Riddler has some of the skills that would be needed to be a crime fighter. He has some of those skills that could actually do this, but he doesn't have all the pieces. He couldn't be the next Batman because he doesn't have the Batman discipline, because he doesn't have the Batman drive. He doesn't have just that little, that, you know, let me steal from the Marvel units. He doesn't have that X factor that makes a hero, that makes a superhero, that makes Batman Batman. And I love just that you know notion because that was a thing when I was reading through this that I was really going through it. Now especially it was going through my own head, you know, how when I was a kid, all these big you know, these big fantasies I I could do that. No, no, I can't. I'm I'm good at my job. I know what I can do. I'm not a storyteller. I can't write comics. I can't do this kind of uh, neat stuff that you know these very creative people can do, but I can appreciate it. And that's the thing, Eddie needs to learn, you know, if he could ever get past the that notion that, you know, what he can and can't do, what he can be, who he is. He is really smart. He could very easily, you know, be a detective. He could be on the side of the angels, but he's not Batman level. I think one of the things that's cool about the Batman story and where there is like a motivating factor to it is... Gotham is this insurmountable place, right? Because you've you, you got to remember there's the corruption and all those pieces in Gotham as well. So realistically, there's so many times where Batman should just give up. I mean, just because of the fact that, you know, the question comes to, and it happens to Batman many times where he'll have these conversations with Alfred where it's like, am I really doing any good? Am I putting a dent? And we've seen it in various stories. And I think it's an interesting exploration because sometimes that drive is how much do you want it? You know, so when it comes to, do you have enough talent? Are you able to do these amazing things? Could Riddler be a hero like Batman? It is the idea of, first of all, what is your end goal? And Batman's has always been to save Gotham, to make sure that nobody, eventually have a city where nobody will go through what he went through as a kid, right? That's his motivating factor. And from that, he has a code. That's why he, there's no killing. You know, it's because of what happened to him. He's, he's got to, you know, stick to his guns on, on certain elements and certain tropes that are important to his code and not compromise those things. It's an interesting motivating fact that Batman isn't always about winning. It's about being driven, Right. Constantly improving yourself. We're going beyond your limitations. You mentioned the X Factor, and I think his X Factor is not so much, it's not that he's got superpower, and I'm agreeing with you on the X Factor thing. His X Factor is he doesn't quit. Even when he's broken, he doesn't quit. Like, he'll have a bad day, he'll have bad days, but he finds a way to pull himself back up again, rebuild himself, whether in a in a new way, even even look at Batman Beyond, right, where he was taken, you know, to the point where his body no longer was able to function the way that it used to, and yet he still found a way to be like a mentor to Terry McGinnis and and contribute and be something more and still try to achieve his goal. 
in a place where it's very hard to do that. <laughs> um, there's something to the character in his, his don't quit attitude, if that makes sense. When it's something that's really when it's really important to you, and I think that sometimes that's the distinction. You start separating, you know, how what is what is just a mild dream, and what is something that is really critically important to you. And when it's something that's really important to you, you keep striving to be better at it. Batman's not about being perfect. It's Batman's about learning from your mistakes and honing yourself and and growing and and becoming something more. I, I would argue that we've seen Batman at his best grow into something more. I think you and I both love the same stories about the Bat family where you see him try to shave off some of his rough edges to be a better parent. I love those stories because I think that's part of Batman's thing. You know, it's it's not that he's perfect. It's about that he tries. Right. Well, it, it is funny because you, you're talking, just got me thinking on something. You sure. know, you know, there's... All of the all of the big heroes, you know, especially the Trinity, have that that little factor about them where it's not about their powers. Yeah. You know, like uh, Diana, it's her compassion. You know, that's the thing that keeps her going, that pushes him. Yeah, she's got superhuman powers. Clark, it's not always just about what he can do; it's about the hope. You know, he always has that hope, that positive attitude that, you know, gets him through the every, you know, when he's beaten down, when he's in, he holds on to that hope. Bruce has that raw, de- that sheer raw determination that that never say die, never quit. That is that factor in him that keeps him going. And again, that's the hero factor. That's the, the moment, that thing that makes them who they are. You know, and I think it's you know kind of neat that you know when you start thinking about just the different heroes, how they go beyond what is what you see in front of them. There's something you know willpower, there's love, there's compassion, there's hope, there's you know all the different emotional spectrums out there. You know, and it's you know kind of neat to see that underlining thing. And it's funny with Eddie because you, you look at him. He was able to, in Arkham Asylum, hide a stash of ice cream, puppies, and guns. How did he get, to, one, how did he get the things? Two, how did he plan it, you know, without being caught? That shows there is a level of intelligence and just amazing that, you know, Eddie has. You know, and that's the kind of thing I loved seeing that because, again, it was a funny moment how the fact that he was able to do it. And even, you know, Miss Tuesday's like, okay, okay, that's pretty funny. I, I like that you pulled this off. How'd you do it, you know? And it was a really cool moment, a great way to end this. But it also does show something that, you know, if he really did want to truly be something beyond the, the air quotes around crazy guy locked him in Arkham, he could be very easily. And I wish, yeah, we. Could, I'd love to see more of Eddie and Miss Tuesday interaction. I'd love to see this Riddler maybe, you know, try to work beyond being the Riddler and being Edward Nigma and just doing what you know that whole that Edward Nigma private eye, you know, investigator, you know, op- operating as a good guy as opposed to being the Riddler. It'd be kind of interesting. This would be an interesting character to see. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So we're back to our friend Jack Ryder, who is continuing kind of our tour of Gotham. And I love that this is really a true tour, where we're seeing just a variety of different elements of Gotham leading to a a back alley and Ace Chemicals and the Amusement Mile. And I love when we see an Amusement Mile, the reality of, did you really want me to turn on the ride, Jack? Are you out of your mind? This was Suicide Amusement (laughs) Mile. What was I thinking? Go, leave the camera if we have to, but run. And hopefully we won't drop dead from tetanus before we get to the van. That was where we get to see exactly what I was talking about earlier on. The side of Jack that you wouldn't see on camera. And I love that they put that panel in there because I thought it was a really important one. This is another funny story of mine. Um, uh, This one I really enjoyed. This, This one with Dick Grayson, where you get to see him operating in the Gotham City Library really as a kid and you see that there is this miss elliot who i didn't see where the miss elliot story was going like and i loved that about her i thought she really was just like truly like this librarian type character 
I didn't think where that was... I thought more of what we got out of Bones was going to be the premise of the story. I love that this story had layers to it and that I didn't see it coming. Sometimes with these 80-page giants in the past, I'm talking about, when you get these anthologies, I think people dismissed anthologies as being something with less depth. You know, these were these tiny stories that didn't have value. Boy, I got to say that's not my experience in the years that we've been doing this podcast and we picked up these books, because this is a great example of that. Every one of these stories in here is valid. Every one of these stories has layers to them. Every one of these stories are thematically interconnected, yes, but also different. And and moving forward, this this well-crafted audio world that they've made. Um, this is not a fluff piece that they put in place because of the fact that they were doing these audios as a way to like promote it. Um, this is every bit... Uh, it stands on its own, certainly, as an 80-page giant. You really don't have to listen to the audios to enjoy this because they're complete stories. But, boy, I got to say, having listened to the audios and then li- jumping into this, it just, again, expands and fleshes out the world and just makes me want more, which... I love that it's accessible in the way that you're referencing, where you haven't been exposed to any of the audio component of this, and yet really enjoyed this as a reading experience. Read it multiple times, which, you know, I think that's one of the things. We talk about reading it multiple times for the show. We never have to do that. That's something we often do out of choice because of the fact that we want to explore the story more. Um, I think it'd be just interesting to say, you know, dude, I couldn't get through this one again. (laughs) You know what I mean? Uh, As far as for conversationally, you know, we've never made the rule that we had to read these stories two or three times in order to prepare for a podcast. We, and that's really a funny part about that. You and I both do it. I, and we talk about how we have these similar experiences doing it, but we've never said Hey, and yeah, read it a couple times before we do the podcast. That was never a thing. We both just naturally do that because the stories lead us back to that as we're thinking through things we want to discuss on this podcast. So it's it's funny that this is another one of those books that I was glad to read it again. Like, it was fun to go through and see it again from, uh, and catch some things that I missed before, see it from a different angle. And this was this Dick Grayson story I thought was a really, really good one. And I really appreciated the art style of this because you see these kids who are like side they're 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 friends of Dick Grayson as much as you can be friends of Dick Grayson because he's got a secret. You see how Dick Grayson kind of keeps everyone at arm's length. Because he has to. Because they can't get to know him the way that they would in a normal friendship situation because he can't tell them everything. There's not a person sitting at the table that he can ever become true best friends with. Why? Because he can't tell them his secrets. He's got the weighted responsibility of not just being Robin, but he also is Batman's sidekick. He could bring down Batman by telling the wrong thing to any one of these four people that he's encountering right here. He lets one thing slip, and that's it. It's done. It's over. What a responsibility for a kid. And it was funny how this story, even though it's not a that's not a prevalent part of this story, it was something I was thinking of when you see him interacting with these kids and the way he is clearly drawn as being like almost on the other side of the table from them. There is a distance. Like these three are clearly close friends. Dick Grayson is a friend of theirs, but he is not he is not on the other side of the table. He's not one of the four. It's three and one. And yeah. I think there's a distinct difference between that kind of friendship relationship and one where he is an in, he is an integrated part of the group. It's funny. Um, one of the things I love about this, and this is something I caught on my second and third read-throughs, the stuff you were talking about, how he's physically distancing himself. Not only you know in the library, but when they're walking down the street moments later, the three of them are in front and he's behind them. Yep. You know, and also I love how he continues the throw off of Batman. The whole talk about of the nuclear submarine and the Batman has that, the nuclear thing. That's all Grayson doing all that. Yeah. Because you, you look at it, it's like, and even the, and I love the one line. He goes, that makes no sense. Wait, that's where you draw the line, Bert? The most unbelievable thing about a man dressed as a Batman is having a submarine? <laughs> that right there really shows the level of dialogue these three kids have about the bat and you know 
Grayson just sits back and throws out little bits like the submarine and things like that so they don't ever really stop and think. But the other thing I caught in my second read, you know, in my art read through was seeing Bones hanging out on thing. Because, you know, I was so focused on the kids and the dialogue, you don't see him standing up against the wall there. So when they start looking at the bike and they start talking about the bike and he just appears out of nowhere. No, he was there the entire time. And they are took the art team took the time to make sure you see him, you know, before he presents himself. And I thought that for me was a really cool moment. Again, that's one of the things I love about doing these, you know, the, the second and third read throughs, my art read throughs where I just look at the artwork and I, you know, I study it. And, you know, it was a little thing like that. I didn't pick up until, again, as I said, multiple read throughs. I love the, the fact that Batman never shows up on the scene for this. This was totally done by this idea that Batman is a thing, you know, a um, a legend. A it actually it goes back to what Batman was saying earlier about being this kind of enigma, and does that get lost in being an agent of the police? Uh, it, it's there's some validity to what Batman was saying in this whole segment. The mystery of Batman sometimes is far more powerful than knowing everything about Batman. And that's not me. I'm actually, I love the deputized Batman in this, so uh, that's not me knocking that approach. But I think there is an interesting balance of Batman with what is known and what is not known here that I think works so well in this story. I love that Bones goes running because of the fact that he thinks Batman heard him because Dick Grayson planted that in his head. Such yep. a great sequence of events, leading him later as Robin to then go on the scene and really find out what's going on with Miss Elliot, which was a thing that who saw that coming? I really <laughs> loved that, you know, she was tied in with the Scarecrow and that whole scenario and using kids. as a, I mean, it's creepy. It's scary. But like using kids as a way to further his agenda in Gotham, uh, just a crazy story. It, that thing that I loved about how never saw that coming, never saw, not only didn't see the Miss Elliot, but then didn't see the Scarecrow connection and all this. Uh, this for me was a great story of swerves. And, you know, again, I love the little moment where, you know, he put, you know, where uh, Dick put the tracking device on him. You see it being like, oh, OK. And just even him having conversations with his friends where he's like, uh, you know, his friends are watching the game, and they think he's sitting in Bruce Wayne's box seats watching the game. In reality, he's being Robin. He's doing his Robin thing. This this had so many different layers of Dick Grayson continuing the illusion. Dick Grayson continuing the story of why people don't think Bruce Wayne is Batman. That's something that this you know the stories really did a cool job with. Yeah, which I think is pretty critical. Making that a thing, I, I really enjoyed. The fact that this created a story where it gives you an idea of what Dick Grayson operates like when he's out of the costume. And I loved that idea that his life is pretty complicated. Like, he'll never be a normal kid in this world. And I think this story did a great job of emphasizing that. And the pressure on Dick Grayson to be a lot more of an adult now than ever before because of the fact that he's got a ton of responsibilities. It He's forced to grow up in kind of the way Batman was um, because of circumstance. It's an interesting conundrum when you take a look at that story to go, is, you, you go, what is right and wrong as far as Batman's relationship with Robin? I love when you get into those pieces because I think, I think there's a complication to that where you can justify the relationship and go, well, what would happen to Dick Grayson if he wasn't with Bruce? And that could be a very ugly story, right? But you also got a question, look at Dick's life when he's with Bruce. And you can see why as Dick's gotten older, there's some resentment. And it's something they're going to have to get through as they get older. Because Bruce is not a normal parent, <laughs> not no. by any stretch. And you actually can see that here. And I think it's such a great story because of that. It doesn't make you all negative about you know, the whole relationship or anything, but it does make you go, there's a reality to the fact that this is not the best thing for a kid, not the best environment for a kid to be raised in. And I love that. Well, I, and I really love that little empty bit about the end there where um, the scarecrow had the anim empty animal cages. 
he wasn't there just to push drugs. He was he had some higher agenda going on. And it's neat because it's something that you know Grayson brings up, but Bruce really didn't. You know, and again, adding to the whole what is next? What's going to happen with this story? What's going to happen here? Because this is one of those stories that has end and then a question mark. So this is a story that, you know, to me, when I'm reading, this is a story that's going to continue on. There's something more happening with uh, the Scarecrow, with the kids, with the even with the little librarian who's going to be away for a very long time. You know, and even as you said, there could be more going on with the, the Bruce and Dick Grayson relationship as a, a spin out of this. So I, I, that's something that really I, I thought was a cool ending in that they could have very easily ended it, wrapped it up. But no, this story's not done yet. Right. If only there was like a 10 episode audio offering that took place after this. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> uh, that's one of the great things about this being a prequel is it does, you could end it there and like leave it to your imagination. Um, the nice part is there's an audio that does continue with a lot of these characters. And, and honestly, even the audio leaves you wanting more of this world. So um, there's a lot to be told here. This Two Face story that was next is is a really good one. The Ike Barinholtz uh, Dennis McNicholas story. I love the character of Two Face. Um, it's funny as I've gotten older, I appreciate the character more and more, even more than I did as a younger kid. I didn't. It's not that I disliked him as a younger kid, but I didn't get so much into the psychology of Two Face until I got older. When you start realizing that this man has two very distinct personalities at battle. And the coin really makes a lot of the decisions for him. And it, it's this story played off the coin really, really well. And this idea that every major decision that he makes, there's a, there's a distinction between path A and path B that it's like a spider web. His whole day could go drastically different based on the coin toss. Um, even though they crossed the street. I mean, like, there was a one bit yeah. where it's like, cross the street, yes or no. Well, if he didn't cross the street, he would have gone in a completely different direction that would have led to none of those events being valid. Like, none of those being choices. What an interesting and, world and, and that he I lives love, in. I love that mug pacifier was an option. <laughs> yes. Yes. But that's an example. He wouldn't even be near that passerby. And it could be a completely different passerby. And maybe nothing would have happened if he went a different direction. It's so funny the way that this story, you know, kind of shows what his world's like. And, and you see somebody die, you know, that didn't have to die because of the fact that the coin toss designated it that way. And, and it's just a simple, it's just some homeless guy. It wasn't any, like, villain. It wasn't any, you know, cop. It wasn't any reason he should kill the guy. The coin toss said yes, and boom, he does it. And I like that notion. You know, again, Harvey is one of those characters you can very easily be sympathetic towards because it's he's really is a mental issue that caused this. He was a good guy. He was one of he was district attorney. He tried to take down the bad guys, but because of everything that happened, it's his life has gone this way. And being so dependent on the coin, you can be very sympathetic towards it. But you also have to remember that this is a killer. This is somebody who is, who does horrific things just because the coin told him to do it. Yeah. And that is something that I, I love about this notion. And even going through this, where he's got the multiple personalities even waging a war inside his head. And how the lettering did it so you could see bad Harvey versus good Harvey's voices, you know. And whether it's the two-faced side or if it's Harvey doing you know, the talking. They made it very clear. And it again, it really shows... Just the level of the, the, oh my God, of who this character is. Yeah, yeah. And that's something I think is really interesting about this. I love the sequence with the two babies, right? And going on the tracks. And he doesn't yeah. toss the coin. And there's the Wayne Foundation for one and for all. And he focuses on that for one and never tosses the coin but saves those kids. I like the idea that there's a Harvey Dent in there still. It, it's interesting how Batman, for as dark as he is... He, he, there is a hope element to Batman that comes out in this story. Wait a night, I'll find him. I can help him. You know, Harvey's still his friend. He still wants to help his friend in spite of what 
happened to him. And I love that element of this story, this idea of his good friend Harvey that's still important to him. Yeah, and again, it's I like seeing Batman and Gordon. I always like that. You know, those two working together and those two understanding. Because, you know, Gordon could very easily say, no, we got to call the forces. And he gives Bruce the time that he's asking for because Bruce is right on this one. He's like, watch the tape again. He didn't flip a coin. He made a selfish decision at the risk to himself to save those babies. And I thought that for me, again, this was a really neat moment. Again, it's showing who Harvey is on this. This was this is a great Harvey Dent story. I did like the fact that this whole thing closed off with the Batwing leading into a quick little Joker story that teased you into the radio show, which I thought, or the uh, the audio podcast, I should say. It's interesting. The the QR code that's on the side of the radio does open up HBO Max, (laughs) which is kind of cool. cool. Yeah. So it's it's a working QR code that's on there. I did check. I liked liked how it ended. The epilogue was really teasing you into the audio adventures. And I, I can say again, I cannot recommend enough if you did not listen to the audio adventures that you seek them out and you do listen to them. The two episodes are available. I think it's just the two that are available right now. Um, you can get them at any of your podcast services. So if you want to try them out first, they're two complete episodes. They're really, really good. Uh, so it's you don't have to have HBO Max to try this out and listen to it. I'm actually looking right now to see. Yes, it's it's still the first two episodes. But it's a 10-episode series, and uh, the first two episodes are complete, like, 35-minute episodes, each one. There's, that's a good way to listen to this. If you don't have HBO Max, you can check them out and get more of the story um, and, and get pulled into the world. So I think that's great that they put them out. And then there's, if you really like it, there's eight more afterwards you can grab on HBO Max. There they are, all alone, except for that old character. I would like to remind everyone about our show voicemail line. It's 1-440-388-4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. We love having you part of the show. Ragingbullets at gmail.com is our email address. If you prefer to contact us that way. Ragingbullets.com is our show website. That feeds into Twitter. It feeds into, feeds into our Facebook fan page. We are also proud to be part of an amazing Facebook group community. And I always pop over there first every day to kind of see where the news and what everybody's do- talking about. Um, it's great reactions to anything that's going on across the comic book medium and pop culture in general. And I just want to thank everyone who participates there because it's such a great community. The About Us section of our show websites, we're going to find out how to connect with us on social media, gaming platforms. We love to interact with all of you. Sponsoring this episode, as always, is DCB Service and InStock Trade. Com. Mr. Segulin, what is going on over DCBService.com? We have Batman the Detective hardcover, 50% off, only $12.49. And we have Batman the Imposter hardcover, 50% off, only $14.99. Thank you, DCBS. That imposter story is awesome, too. Yeah, that's a cool one. Over at InStockTrades.com, we've got the Batman Fortnite Zero Point hardcover, part of their deals of the week. It's 65% off, only $8.74. Crisis on Multiple Earths, Book One Crossing Over Trade Paperback, 55% off, $39.99 regularly, only $17.99. DC Poster Portfolio J. Lee Trade Paperback, $24.99 regularly, 65% off, only $8.74. Green Arrow, 80 Years of the Emerald Archer, the Deluxe Edition, is $29.99 regularly, 60% off, only $11.99. Amazing deals on amazing books. I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. Our next episode, Jim and I are going to be back, and we're going to begin a look at the Aquaman miniseries that have been coming out recently. A lot going on with uh, our favorite uh, underwater superhero. We'll be talking about that next week. Bye. All right, you guys. Are you ready to sing your song? I carry on. Yeah, let's sing it now. Okay, this should be fun. Now get ready for your cue. Okay, Sean? Okay. Okay, Jim? Jim? Jim!
Okay, fellas, get ready. That was very good, Sean. Naturally. Uh, Jim, you're a little flat there, so be careful. Jim. Jim. Jim! Excellent job, guys. Let's sing it again. Yeah, let's sing it again. No, no, that's enough. Let's not push it. Push it? What is that? Yeah, what are you talking about? No, I don't. I didn't mean to buy that. I think it's going to be my song. 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 I think it's going to be my song.